Bibles, 1 Corinthians, I'm going back to chapter 1 again. And then I haven't covered this enough already, right? I've been in this book here several times in the last year. There's a reason why. There's a reason why this in particular. I have some friends that are preaching and teaching around in the good old U.S. Bay, some of them. Reports I hear that people are getting upset over some things, some little things that they don't need to be getting upset about, or worse, they're going and jumping in with people that they should not be jumping in with. And it's causing a great deal of stress. Now, the reason I say that is because a lot of people are trying to say they need to be all one big happy family, whether they believe in the same God or not. And that's dangerous, very dangerous. We need to be willing to believe in the same God. We need to trust in the same God. The problem is that a lot of people are being lured away by the teaching of men. And when we go, and as men, we go and make up our own beliefs and how we're going to do things and how we're going to read the Bible and how we're going to interpret the Bible and how we're going to study the Bible and this, that, and the other, we've got a problem. Because men can't get it right. We can't. God's got it right. God's got it right here in the Scripture. A lot of people look at that and say, well, everybody reads it differently. Well, if everybody reads it differently, we need to look at a couple of things that unify us. Do I believe in, in liberty in the Scripture? Absolutely I do. I'll fight for grace and mercy and liberty that's found in opinion. I will. I have no problem in that. However, we can't go and just say everybody's got it right. Not everybody's got it right. Would you agree with that? Better said, let's go back in history a little bit. Let's go back. Did Jim Jones have it right? Y'all remember Jim Jones? Remember the People's Temple? Remember that over in California? Yeah. What did Jim lead them to? Jim lead them to Guyana and ended up killing half of them. And some of them committed suicide. The other half committed suicide. Now, folks... Is that biblical? Not according to my looking at this, but according to his way, that was right. And they're good and they're going to heaven. Is that dangerous? You bet it is. And it's wrong. You see, it's like reading the road map. You can be misdirected. You can go and take things the wrong way, but you better know, you better know which way is north, right? You better know which way you're going. And have some idea of which way and which direction you're going. And that's the problem of many in the church today, not just in the Christian church, Church of Christ, but in any congregation. And I want to talk about division. And the reason I want to talk about division is because it's killing everybody. It's not just killing the Christian church, it's killing everybody outside as well. Because when people see division here, what they see they see a group of people that don't even know what they believe in. Well, you don't know what's right either. How can you tell me that you believe what the Bible says when this guy over here is saying what he thinks the Bible says? Is that right? Is that the way to be? No. We have to be willing to read Scripture as God intended, not as we want it to say. We can't twist the word of God around and make it just say whatever we think is right. We have to be willing to say what needs to be said and not be afraid of it. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because there is division, even in the Christian church. But we need to be more inviting. Yes, we do need to be inviting. We sure do. But we don't need to invite based on what our opinion is. We need to invite based on what God's word says. And we need to be able to encourage and inspire people to go beyond what, beyond what people say and, what, and follow what scripture says. To be guided by God's principles. Let's have a look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I want to look at verse 10 closely here. And we're going to be flipping around in the book of 1 Corinthians for a little bit. First three chapters covers the vision. And there's a reason for that. The main problem at the Corinth church was the vision. They were wanting to do things their way instead of God's way. And the proof is that right here. 
And I exhort you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you have made complete in the same that you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. You catch that? You see what that said? To be in the same mind and the same judgment. To be able to read and be in one mind, just as Ephesians 4 says, one faith, one hope, one baptism. Why does it say that? Because there is no other faith of name that saves other than Jesus Christ. It is in his name we are saved. It is in Jesus alone we are saved. Let me repeat that one more time. It is in Jesus Christ alone. Not anybody else. No other name under heaven and earth can be said that of. Nobody can claim to be the salvation of God except Jesus Christ. Not one name. Not one belief other than Jesus Christ. Now I know a lot of people get anxious about that, right? Everybody's going to interpret the Bible a little differently. Yeah, at some point you can do that. There is liberty what about when Jesus says or when the apostles say we need to do things? <laughs> what then? Is there liberty there? Is there liberty over doctrine? When doctrine says that on, the first day, that on that first day the church was instituted, it says right there in Acts 2.42, they continuously devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayer. Those four things. Let's look at them real carefully. The Apostles' Doctrine. That is the teaching of the Word of Christ. It's what we're going through right here. That's what we're doing. We're studying God's Word. And that's what we're studying. We're studying what the Apostles learned from Jesus Christ. And being able to break it down and be able to tell it to people who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> fellowship. What's fellowship? The fellowship is the coming together of saints. To be united as one body, one single body under God. Not under other, in any other name but Jesus Christ. And being centered around what the Lord wants for us. To be Christians only. I don't want to be anything else. It's not because we're a denomination. It's because I only want to be called by Christ alone. I want to be His. I don't want anybody else. I don't need anybody else. I don't need anybody to tell me what to believe in, what not to believe in. I have what Jesus says right here. This is the word of truth. And if I follow what this says, it's not going to lead me astray. This is what unifies. What men do divides, as we'll see here. That's what fellowship is, being united under Christ and being able to be of one like mind. To break the bread. It says the breaking of bread. It doesn't say... To have a fellowship meal, it says the breaking of bread. If they wanted to say they were eating together and, and doing that, that's fine. It would say that. But it says the breaking of bread. The is the word. The is the big word there. What is the breaking of bread? The breaking of bread is coming together around the Lord's supper table. Then remember to take time out to remember Jesus Christ. And to prayer. My goodness, I don't know about you, but I need prayer every day. And I need to be praying every day. I have to. Because this world is not letting up. This world is not going to let up on us as Christians. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So we've got to be willing to take our stand. And we need to be willing to be proud of our Lord and Savior. We need to defend the kingdom at all costs. That people will have to climb over our bodies to get to hell. Seriously, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to give ourselves completely to them to where folks understand how committed we are to Christ? That we're going to do everything we can to keep them from going to heaven? That's how we should be. That starts with prayer. Be mobilized and prayerful and study His Word together and be a part of the kingdom. Be in fellowship. Remember who you serve. These guys were having some problems with that. 
The Corinth church was having a lot of issues with that. Keep on reading here. It says in verse 11, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, you are quarreling amongst yourselves. Now that I mean that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Now, I'm not going to point out division names. I'm not going to go and I'm not going to name denominations. I don't believe in doing that right now. I believe in saying something more. The issue is less denominationalism and more of the teachers that they put their trust in. You see, that's the biggest problem right now at all. We're putting our trust in people in the pulpit and people that are leading people astray. And we need, as leaders in the church, to stand up. And we need to call out sin as sin and be ready to defend the gospel. To show the weak people in this world that God is serious about what he means. I read this and I don't see Paul or Apollos or Cephas in there. No, no, no. The reason I do is because I'm looking at what it says and how it's saying. Now I mean this. Each one of you are saying, I am of Paul, right? That's what it says. No, I don't see that. You know what I see? I am of Calvin. I'm of Calvin. I am of Wesley. I am of Luther. I am of Swing. Now, some of you folks may not know those names, recognize those names. I hope you do. If you don't, I can inform you who those people are. They were great men of the faith, studied and got into the Word and looked at what Scripture said. Some of them had some good ideas. But they also had some really bad ideas. Martin Luther said that the Catholic Church was going in the wrong direction and they needed to show more grace. True. And they needed to be able to help get away from the works salvation that they were falling into and start trusting in God's grace. Yes, that's important. God's grace is what saves us. But what is not what saves us is what he said. He went and changed the entire meaning of Romans to say that faith only saves. So better said, you don't even have to respond in faith. All you got to do is believe. He said that, what, that baptism, much like Calvin would, that baptism was an outward sign of an inward grace. That God's already got it together. That's what Calvin said. Calvin went to the point, John Calvin said that he believed that God, and this is found in his own words, that God caused Adam and Eve to sin. Now, i got a question for you. Where is that in Scripture? I know where it's not in Scripture. I know what James says about that. He said, if there are people that say, if there are people that go and say that God is causing them to stray, God is testing them, God is tempting them, then they should be called liars. Why? Because God cannot tempt and cannot be tempted. Because God doesn't sin and God doesn't condone sin. So what Calvin believed, what Luther may have believed in the same instance, is not true. But they teach it to everybody. Calvinism is becoming a rampant plague among many churches today. They think they don't have to do anything. They don't have to go witness. They don't have to go worship. They don't have to go do anything. Oh, I can go get God under a tree somewhere. As long as I know I'm chosen. <coughs> do you know how you know you're chosen? You start living for Jesus. That's how. You start accepting the fact that you have free will and you have a conscience. And your conscience is telling you, you need to go and be with Jesus. You've got to get things straight. And you've got to get your eyeballs out of the world and start looking at what God's Word says. I know that seems hard, but it's true. It's so true. And I don't want to be mean to people. I'm just saying, look, look what Scripture says. 
Don't focus on the world. Don't focus on what's popular. That's the biggest thing. Most of these congregations, these big congregations that are going around everywhere and, and saying that, they're saying Calvinism. Just come on and be with us. Be with us. Believe in Christ. That's all you have to do. Is that right? No. It says that we have a responsibility to obey the gospel. We have a responsibility to come to God on His terms. Not ours. Oh, that's legalism that you're talking about. No, it's not. Is that legalism that Paul's talking about? No, he's saying there doesn't need to be division. Paul's saying, open your eyes and see that you guys are being people and you're not worshiping God. That you're not being servants. That you're not coming to know God on His terms. You're doing it because you want to do it and say, I'm right and you're wrong. That's not the way we do things. We don't do it to say we're right, we're wrong, or our family's right, you're wrong. Nothing else, or that's the way my mama always raised me to be. Nothing like that. The truth is the truth no matter what happens, no matter what our feelings are, the truth is truth. God's truth is He doesn't want division. What did Jesus pray in the garden? Jesus prayed for unity in the church. In John chapter 17, he prayed for unity in the church. He prayed for oneness in the church. That those that would follow after the apostles would be of one mind, of one body, just as he and the Lord were one mind and one body. So too we should be. One mind, one body. But people have different opinions. Yes, they do. And in some things there are needs for that. Hey, for instance, that piano. My goodness, I can't tell you how many arguments I've had because of a piano. Oh, you can't have instruments in church. Why not? Because of what Ephesians 5.19 says. It says we should be singing out with our hearts, not with musical <laughs> instruments. And I ask them, reach into your pocket, pull out that little, little circular thing there that they call a pitch pipe. What is that? It's a mechanical instrument. No, it's not. That's not a musical instrument. I can play Mary had a little lamb on it. Same way. I could have flute. And if that's not good, if that's not it, I'm not asking also if it's an instrument. I am asking, is it biblical? Is it in scripture anywhere? No. That's liberty. You're allowed to have a pitch pipe. That's fine. Play a pitch pipe. You're allowed to have a piano. That's fine too. Romans 14. Go read Romans 14 one day. And look what that's saying. And then they'll go and argue. Well, if you want to go to that extreme, you better have it in the house then. You should go and not have a building to meet in. You should have home church. Okay, fine. We'll have home church. You do realize I have piano in the house, don't you? Does that mean that my, that my church and the people that come to our congregation in the house, they're going to go to hell because they have piano in there? You still got to be born again. You That's got, it. You got to stay there. That's it. You've got to be born again. That's hard to do. Amen. <laughs> it sure is. You've got to be born again, and you've got to stay there. That means you've got to keep running the race. You've got to keep running the race. It's one of the things that tears me up is that people just don't see the need to run the race. They sit down and they act like it's okay. It's all right. I'll be fine. I'll drift through this life. No. You can't. This is a race. And we're running to the end. We've got to be willing to go and, and, and run the race. Not look around and be distracted. <coughs> We've got to be ready to run the race. And it breaks my heart that so many don't. That so many would choose to live a life outside of Christ. Or to think that they are inside of Christ and are being misled. Men will mislead you. That's why I tell people all the time, I know people get sick hearing me say it. Don't go by what I'm saying. Go by what Scripture says. Look at what Scripture says. Don't go by my words. Look at what the Word of God is saying right here. That says it right there. He doesn't want division. He doesn't want all that. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 with me. You're going to find out. He talks about division for the first three chapters. And there's a reason for that. This church was so messed up. They were so hung up on being right 
individual pride, individual ideas that they didn't see the truth right in front of them. That this is not about us, this is about Jesus. When we come to worship, we are here for Jesus. We're not here for me, we're not here for, for anything else, we're not here about feeding our need or feeding our wants or doing whatever we want. It is about being with Jesus, worshiping Jesus, praising Jesus, giving Jesus all the glory because that is who has written and directed our faith. He is the one who was willing to die on the cross for us. We could not do it. We could not pay the price. But look on here. Verse 1 here. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Why? Because they were acting like babies in Christ. They weren't listening. They were doing things that they wanted to do. They were doing things their way. They were going about it their way. Paul said, look, I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to give you the easiest way I can to help you understand and be able to talk not above your head. Everybody tries to put so much into Scripture and they put so much into it and inject so much into it that it makes it as unreadable as anything that the Pharisees could have come up with back in the day. God's Word is not difficult to understand. God's Word is as simple and as plain as day. What does God say we need to do? We need to change. We need to be different. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you're not yet able. For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like men, mere men at that? For when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you, tell, are you not mere men? Let me tell you something. This came out in the church. Apollos was at the church at the time. Apollos was trying his best to teach the people the right way and teach the word of God. It got to the point that Apollos said, I'm done. I am going to step away. I'm going to give this over to somebody else. And I'm going to go over to this other congregation and work. Because you all need to get your priorities straight and get me out of this. Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. He did. He left. He walked out. Not to say that he did it out of meanness or spite. He was trying to get them back on track. And they had another guy come in, and he went, and he was their minister, and he guided and directed them to that principle that needed to be done. It was after, it was after that things got started getting worked out and started being right, and the church was starting to get things together, that Apollos came back and was actually one of the elders in the church at Corinth. You see, Apollos wasn't the one to blame. Paul wasn't the one to blame. Paul or Peter wasn't the one to blame. No one was to blame except these people. You see, that's the problem. When we follow men, we are going to be let down. When we follow Christ and we are true to Christ, we are going to be re reborn. We're going to be living new lives. We are going to be focused on serving Him. We're not going to be focused on us. We're going to be focused on Christ. Look what it says. When then is Apollo? Who the, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God, God has caused the growth. It's not anything we've done, it's nothing that the men are doing, it's all on God. That means they have to give it to God. They haven't done that. They have given it to themselves. They've given themselves over to the teachings of men and believing that they are right instead of God being right. Men cannot be right unless they are founded in the principles of God's word and truthfully in God's word. Not being misdirected, not going according to what they feel like. Feelings have nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with what scripture says. 
and how we live our life. Yes, we do need to have liberty. Yes, when it comes to matters of opinion, by all means, there needs to be some liberty. But I'm going to tell you this right now. When God's word speaks and it says we need to do something, we need to do it. Look at what it says here in verse 18. Go over to verse 18, chapter 3. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks he is wise and good at this age, he must become foolish. Better said, there are going to be people that will say, you're full of yourself. You're, you're silly. How in the world can you believe that? Everybody's going to read the Bible differently. Everybody's going to see things differently. I bet if you ask everybody in the church view there, they're going to think something different. Yeah, you're right. They will. But when you're in here, and when you're hearing God's Word, and you see what God's Word says, who are you arguing with? Are you arguing with the preacher? Are you arguing with the congregation? Or are you arguing with God? When God's Word says it, we do it. When God's word says be baptized, you be baptized. When God's word says you go and you believe and you repent and you confess, yes, you believe, repent, and confess. But he also says in there that you keep on walking, keep on serving, keep on living, keep on being a part of that. Don't let your anxiety get the best of you. Don't let yourself get discouraged and sit down and think you're saved to sit. You're not. You are saved to serve. Just like Paul, just like Apollos. We'll do plant, some will do planting, some will go in water, some will go and, and, and reach out and do cultivation, whatever needs to be done in order to get the field prime. Those people are going to be doing the work. We're going to get out there and do it. But God's going to be the one that gets the glory. In the end, he's going to be the one to harvest. He's the one that's going to be the means by which it's done. But we have got to be willing to trust in him. Here, first. Not ourselves, not men. Not in the teachings of men. Not in the misdirections of men. Only in God. And in His Word. His Word is infallible. He's not going to misdirect us. He is the one, it says here, for it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the, uh, the uh, reasonings of the wise that they are useless. So then let no one boast in men for all things belong to you, whether you're Paul or Apollos or Cephas or in the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you. You belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Now, I know that's, some of that's a little over the head of a lot of folks. But I'm going to tell you this as simple as I can. Just like Paul did. It's time for us to look and evaluate what we believe in. Do we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ as written in the infallible word? Do we believe in the truth that's written in there? Do we believe that he unites and unifies and builds up and strengthens? Or do we believe in a false gospel? Do we believe in a gospel that everybody's going to be all right, no matter where they're at, where they're going, anything like that? They keep on doing what they're doing. As long as they believe in Jesus, they're fine. Until I was 27 years old, I believed in Jesus. And I believe in Jesus. I mean, I said I did. I believe in Jesus. But what was wrong? I wasn't living for Jesus. I wasn't being in Jesus. I wasn't living in Jesus. I was walking away from Jesus. And I believe in Jesus. Sure. So does the devil. Children of the demons of hell, they shudder in fear. Folks, I'm telling you, there's more to life than believing in Jesus. You need to be living in Jesus. And until we, as the church, become, start realizing we need to be biblical instead of popular, it's not going to happen. We can go and believe in all the popular teachings. We can go and serve in our way. We can bring people in on handshakes. We can do all that stuff you want to do. But you know what's going to win people to Christ? Truth. The truth will lead people to Christ. Not me. 
Not you. Not the beliefs of the congregation of people, but the truth of Jesus Christ found in his word. I can't do it. You can't do it. But what we can do is we can work. We can cultivate. We can water. We can plant. We can get out there and show the people of this world that if you go biblical instead of popular, if you go biblical by the principles that are found in God's truth, found in the Bible right here, the infallible word of God, you go with this. He's not going to lead people into division. He's going to feel, he's going to lead people to be united. He's going to bring people together. He is going to strengthen and be bolder. He's going to work and unite. God doesn't want his people divided. He wants them to be united and strong. Not arguing amongst themselves over the little things. But being true to what he wants and what he says is true. Right here in God's word. Today, if you've got a decision in your heart to be changed, make it today. Don't put off. You hear me? Don't put it off. This world will do everything it can to turn you away from what this truth says. This is not a truth. People will say, well, that's your truth, not mine. This is the truth. Truth is not optional. Truth is not in the mind of a person. There can be one truth and the rest are falsehoods. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You believe that? I do. Don't be believing men. Believe Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Be willing to come to Him on His terms. Confess the name of Jesus Christ. Be willing to repent of your sin. Turn it over to Him. Give it to Him. No man is above sin. No man is irredeemable. Christ redeems all who come to Him. This morning, if you've got a decision in your heart to be made old, to be made new, don't delay it. Please don't. Be willing to come to Jesus. Believe, repent, confess. Be baptized. Walk in the newness of life. Be transformed. Be united with Him. Be united with His church. Not a... Not not some body of people. His body. His people. Be united with Him.